Now, we've had a number of occasions like this over the years where we welcome a great painting to this collection. Um, last time, I think, was the Guercino over here and um, before the Franz House here. And um, so three great paintings in this room. And on this occasion, we're delighted to welcome uh, to Toledo Museum of Art a masterwork by Luca Giordano, The Liberation of St. Peter. We're particularly uh, thrilled about this work because it is proof again, if proof is needed, that this private museum, available free to the public since its foundation, is made possible by our members and those who support us. And so many of you are here this evening. So this is your painting. It's a painting for us all and for us all to share with all of our visitors who come to this great city of Toledo. But I'm particularly delighted uh, this evening to acknowledge with gratitude the Most Reverend Daniel Thomas, Bishop of Toledo, uh, for joining us this evening. <laughs> Came back from Baltimore today and to join us here in Toledo um, at this museum, which I hope will become uh, something of a, a sanctuary uh, for him as it is for so many people um, with all of its wonderful examples uh, of the creative capacity of humanity over time. Now this room is full of works which have particular characteristics and many of these works would have been made into live theatre, into performance at the time of their making. Larry Nichols made this point when we acquired a wonderful work by the great Spanish sculptor Montañas just down here, uh, which actually came with its garments especially for when it would be used on the Feast of Corpus Christi, as it would be paraded around the city. And many of these works, which while they are flat on the walls to us today, would have been in a time of pre-literacy, acted out and performed, as indeed happens in many churches today, especially in the days around Good Friday. So bringing artworks alive in performance and acting them is something that makes them real. And this evening, we're going to attempt to do that by engaging in conversation about this particular work. Here at the museum, over many years, we've crafted a model for art museums, which is that we want to have only the best. That means, quite frankly, that we would rather not have a work by an artist if it wasn't absolutely top grade. So unlike many museums, we are absolutely not trying to be encyclopedic or even representative. We're trying to have works of art that show at their greatest for this city of Toledo, which can't really try to be encyclopedic anyway, the capacity of great artists over time. Now, in this spot for many, many years, many of you will know, was a painting called The Flight into Egypt, another biblical story, by Luca Giordano. And over the last number of years, as we've done in times past, we've been reviewing all aspects of the collection. And Larry Nichols, um, our curator of these wonderful works of art of the 17th century, has brought a parade of great scholars past all of these works. And all of them agreed with us that somehow the flight into Egypt did not elevate the room, but frankly, rather made it sag. And this was unfortunate, because all around, we have great works of art. I mean, look at this Rubens. Absolutely and undoubtedly regarded as the greatest Peter Paul Rubens painting in America. It has a wonderful, central, gleaming glow of a baby Jesus, who's divine and man. And this particular painting echoes it with this pop of light in the center. So now we have something happening here which is indeed, I think, extraordinary. Now, I don't want to go on about this painting when I have a 17th century expert with me. And Dr. Lawrence Larry Nichols is the William Hutton Senior Curator of European and American Painting and Sculpture before 1900, which we usually say is the William Hutton Curator of European Art. And he has been with us since 1992. And those of us who move around a bit tend to really admire people who stay. 
And when you stay, there has to be a reason. And for Larry, it was that he had a great, great collection that he could burnish and add to over the years. And he has done that. He worked at the Philadelphia Museum of Art before he came to Toledo. And he's a specialist in Northern Baroque painting. He did his studies, uh, his PhD at Columbia, uh, and his BA at Dartmouth College. And he's curated lots of exhibitions, as you know, from Manet portraits recently with the Royal Academy in London uh, to the Van Gogh Fields exhibition, which was so popular, to the Goltzius exhibition, which celebrated his own dissertation, which is now a phenomenally thick doorstop of a book and um, that came out last year. But the main thing that he does is he works with our Apollo Society. He works with all people who care about paintings. The chairman of the Department of Paintings and Sculpture from the Metropolitan Museum in New York, with whom he spent the entire day on Monday salivating over this wonderful collection <laughs> and adding in wonderful works of art by Franz Hals, by Chardin, the most exquisite pair of Chardins in America, by Delacroix, and today by Luca Giordano. Please make Larry Nichols welcome. Thank you very much, Brian. And I also want to extend my gratitude to Bishop Thomas for his participation in the museum's program this evening. This past weekend, in the Week in Review section of one of the Sunday papers I read, maybe some of you saw it as well, there appeared an article about an individual who, of his own choosing, lives four months of every year without electricity so as to experience the world in that circumstance. Might the colleague I have asked to turn off the gallery lights please do so at this time. The very first thing I did 11 and a half hours ago when I arrived at the museum today was to come to this gallery to look yet again at our newly acquired painting by Luca Giordano, The Liberation of St. Peter. And this is essentially how I experienced it. As our eyes are somewhat adjusting to the darkness, I ask you, what is it that we see? And I'm the first to admit very little. But the brightest section of the artist's composition is the center very comparably to the Rubens that Brian mentioned gleaming in the center, the Christ child. And what was and what has the artist painted in that area? The angel and the aura of light around him. What we're experiencing is how a 17th century viewer in Naples, probably in a church setting, often would have experienced how he or she would have experienced the painting as well. Now, to be sure, at times there would have been daylight and, of course, candle illumination. Yet this rather atypical exercise I'm bold enough to undertake with you all, I hope has provided insight into how we are to interpret the significance of the artist's conscious creative decision with respect to light. Our attention is purposely directed at the role of the divine in the narrative he depicted. May we have the gallery lights back on, please. <clears throat> the textural source for the narrative depicted is told in the book of Acts, chapter 12, and Bishop Thomas shall be reading that to us later. I'll be paraphrasing it for you as I help you look at this picture. And I've just spoken about light in the upper right of the picture, there's a lantern, but there's no light coming from it. The source of light within this painting, in a narrative described as happening at night, instead is the, as the Bible has it, light that shined in the prison. Uh, the radiance emanating from the resplendent and divine messenger. There are ten figures in this composition, four at right, two in the center, uh, 
and uh, four at, so four at left, two in the center, and four at right. And their identities are, six of them are guards, five asleep, one in the process of being put to sleep. <clears throat> Two fellow prisoners in the upper right, chained and oblivious to what's going on, just as the guards are. And then the central figures, the angel and Peter. So that's the identity of the figures. But let's look at it formally, how the artist created his composition as well. There's a triangular group in the lower right, as there is in the lower center. There's a vertical in the center, that leg of the angel, levitating right there with a cast shadow near it. And there's a diagonal, not only of the other leg of the angel, but also of St. Peter fleeing. And if you attempt to stand as canted as his fake form is, you'll see that the implication is a figure running and moving. And as I've stressed, the centrality of those figures certainly is giving primacy to them within the narrative. The angel has wings. Courbet, that great 19th century artist, the realist, said, show me an angel and I'll paint one. Uh, Mr. Giordano was willing to uh, depict the unseeable for his audiences. So there's cast shadow, there's wings, there's levitation, there's an upright angel. So they, all of this together is telling us of the supernatural and the divine and also of certainty and formality and solidity. Think of the columns on the front of this very museum. Peter, on the other hand, is earthbound. He's leaning forward, as I said. He's the mortal in this confrontation of spiritual and mortal. The next passage uh, that after this exact narrative that Bishop Thomas will read goes on to say, and he, Peter, went out and followed and followed him, meaning the angel, and Peter wist not that it was true what the angel had done, meaning set him free. And so uh, Peter here is bewildered but obedient. I had an undergraduate professor, a man named Frank Robinson, who spoke in class of, of repeatedly of the language of hands. Look at the hands in this painting, as well as the other 16 paintings in this uh, room. In fact, every other painting in this room, except perhaps this portrait, the hands are vital to understanding the narrative that the painters are depicting. The angel's hand is directing Peter, but it's also putting to sleep the guard in the upper left. Peter's hands in front of him are reflective of obedience and perhaps even reference and not inconceivably even suggesting a cross, not dissimilar from the way two pieces of wood in the upper left of the Murillo Adoration of the Kings that I'm pointing at to your right uh, may well allude to as well. The guard's hands in the foreground, let's take a look at the one at right, slumber to be sure. So hands are very important. Perhaps the best example in the entire museum is a gallery or two away, um, El Greco's uh, The Agony in the Garden where Christ kneeling at the angel appearing to him holding the cup has hands at different levels. The equivocation as he's struggling, the word agony actually meaning struggle. So within the Luca Giordano, I submit to you all there's a juxtaposition of two manners, realism and idealism. A rugged realism in the foreground of those soldiers muscular physiques, armor, weapons, garments, yet they're impotent in any ability to act. And then the angel, perhaps redolent of a painting Luca Giordano would have seen in the Vatican in, in, in a room that Raphael painted of this very subject. There's a, therefore a dichotomy of two styles. Giordano's rugged naturalism or realism and the ideal. And this is then suggesting the duality of the mortal and the spiritual. The artist of the evening, Luca Giordano, was born in Naples in 1634. His father was a painter with whom he presumably initially studied. 
uh, and the father was also an art dealer. But the artist, Luca Giordano, then apprenticed in his native city with a Spaniard who was in Naples at the time, Naples being a Spanish territory at that moment in history, an artist named Giuseppe Ribera. And from this podium, if I take one step, two steps to my side, I'm looking at the Toledo Museum of Art's portrait of a musician to your right hanging in there by Luca Giordano. If you can't see it presently, take this merely as an enticement to go look at it subsequently. <clears throat> and this contact with Giordano was his uh, approach and, and experience of learning how to render uh, tactile naturalism, his convincing realism, take a look at the feet of the soldier in the foreground right. He doesn't have his sandals on. Those are dirty feet, people. We need to look closely and actually understand that the artist was looking very closely. An artist in the background even of Ribera, um, Caravaggio, painted a picture on commission uh, of the death of the Virgin, and it was rejected by the church uh, due to how uh, unsacred virgin was rendered with dirt on her fingers and, and to under her toenails. So I'm, I'm stressing the, the realism so as to allow the, an understanding of how this picture in its 17th century context would have still uh, been understood and, and perhaps comparably to how we do today. Giordano was well traveled within Italy um, from his teenage years on. He looked He'd been in Rome, Florence, Venice. He looked at the artists Raphael, I've alluded to, Titian, Veronese. We have a picture by Veronese uh, in one of our galleries nearby. Tintoretto. He knew the work from Pietro d'Or Cortona, a painting uh, behind you all that I'm looking at right there. Uh, Mattea Preti, a painting to your left. Uh, Herod realizing his, uh, his, the results of his actions in the beheading of John the Baptist. And this artist was also aware of Rubens and Poussin, two examples in this gallery as well. Luca Giordano was extremely prolific. His nickname was Luca fa presto, Luca works fast, or Luca the fast worker. He was very sought after in his own uh, career. He had commissions from the Medici court in Italy, uh, he, and he served the Spanish king in Madrid, Charles II, from 1692 until his return to Naples uh, some years prior to Giordano's death in 1705. Now we do not have any commission. We don't know who, why Giordano created this painting. Given its scale, given the uh, degree of work on it, it had to have been a commission, and that means by the Roman Catholic Church. Its ambition and scale certainly suggest it may have been an altarpiece. We think of altarpieces generally in a vertical upright position, but it's not out of the bounds of plausibility that this too assumed that role. On stylistic grounds, jargon for art historians thinking they know what they're talking about, we can date this picture to the early 1660s. And hence, as been noted by another art historian, Giordano painted the liberation of St. Peter in the years of celebration and thanksgiving following the end of a plague that had devastated Naples and concluded in 1656. So within five to eight years after that, this painting comes into existence. And it's not unlikely that the subject of St. Peter's freeing from prison for its Neapolitan 1660s audience uh, had an immense symbolic and metaphoric power. Uh, the story doubtless engendered associations with the sudden call to God the freeing from darkness of this world and from the bonds of sin, the power of prayer, which you'll hear is cited uh, right in the passage when Bishop Thomas reads it shortly, and perhaps first and foremost, the theme of deliverance. I'm a strong believer old master paintings are relevant to us today. The parallel I would ask us all to contemplate is uh, Remember, a painting right after a plague that decimated a, an enormous population, segment of the population of Naples. Think of what was transpiring in our country and elsewhere in the world uh, beginning in the late uh, 1970s, the AIDS epidemic, which engendered a great deal of artistic response. 
and doubtless there will be forthcoming responses to the current calamity of the Ebola outbreak. If we don't know for certain the orig original location of the painting that the museum introduces this evening, let me raise what is known about the provenance, the past ownership then, of the picture. It was acquired somehow by a member of an English family, the Mackenzies, probably during the second half of the 19th century. And the picture hung in their estate, Folly Court, in Buckinghamshire, which had been in the possession of the Mackenzie family since 1853. I cannot resist the following. As an arcane but fascinating aside, for those enthusi enthusiasts and devotees of Kenneth Graham's The Wind in the Willows, written in 1908, and I read it to my daughter Margaret, who's in this very room, the inspiration for Toad Hall is reputed to have been the very castle where the painting hung for over a century. It descended at the painting, as did that castle for that matter, with the family until the painting came on re recently came onto the market. And our consideration of this painting commenced in March of 2012 when Brian Kennedy and I were at the European Fine Arts Fair in Maastricht, the Netherlands, and we spotted this picture, as did all fair goers, uh, a, a diligent ones. Uh, at, on the stand of a London dealer, Patrick Matisson, as, as has been reported uh, in the press. I saw this picture again in a very cold London warehouse in January of 2013, and subsequently um, studied other paintings by Giordano in museums and churches from Bergamo, London, Canberra, where I've not been, but a painting that Brian Kennedy had the National Gallery of Australia acquire there, hung in the Philadelphia Museum of Art when I uh, was working there from 86 to 92. I also studied pictures by Giordano in Cleveland, Chicago, Detroit, New York, Richmond, Sarasota, and Williamsburg. I has also looked at my notes closely from an ex experience in Naples in 2010. So this is the process that's ongoing of how purchase considerations play out. As Brian's alluded to, we conducted uh, a great deal of contact with uh, colleagues and specialists of Luca Giordano. We made market comparisons of the past and present. And then in July of this year, we had the picture come to Toledo for purchase consideration further. I remember the day because it was Bastille Day. My colleagues, the art handlers, installed this picture. And Brian and I and others continued to assess it. Uh, we brought in uh, con conservators, pa uh, painting conservators, and our own uh, object conservator, Suzanne Hargrove. We all assessed it and, and were verified that the condition of the canvas and the paint layer is superb. And so in uh, the early autumn, Brian presents the painting to the Board of Trustees Art Committee. Negoti approval ensued. Uh, then, uh, often in a good cop, bad cop way, the director engages, I'm the good cop, Brian positions himself. Otherwise, it works. Um, we communicated with the dealer and, and ended up with an agreed upon negotiated situation and the acquisition was Toledo's. <laughs> Since we've taken ownership of it, uh, we have revarnished the painting. Varnish is uh, a protective coat put on an oil painting uh, to uh, preserve the, the paint layer underneath, to also provide uh, saturation for colors, uh, varnishes that discolor over time, and that means decades, if not centuries. Can uh, the, Luke, the Guido Rainey is the next picture in this room to get a cleaning. Uh, that image of Venus over there needs, she needs to be uh, restored. We're getting there. So in this instance, all we have to do is put a brighter, a newer varnish on it. So many of you are interested in, in frames. I sure am. This is a 17th century frame. Whether it's Portuguese or Spanish, we're not sure, but it is certainly appropriate for the picture. In conclusion, I was certain my fellow Toledo curators who were of great assistance in this acquisition were certain, and the director was certain that this acquisition would be a superlative one. But we are all the more happy to bear witness to recent praise for it from professional colleagues. 
Brian's alluded to the visit earlier this week of the head of the chairman of the painting department of the Metropolitan, Keith Christensen. He knew of the painting and was very happy to see it in this institution and loves it. Giuseppe Scavizzi, the author of the monograph, the catalog raisonné of, of uh, Luca Giordano, wrote just in the last week and a half, and I quote, because I'm very proud of this quote, I am glad that the painting went to a public collection and I'm particularly glad that it went to such an important institution as the Toledo Museum. It is, in my view, the best painting by Giordano in an American museum. The Tribune de l'Art, a French blog, wrote, writes of it as authentique chef d'oeuvre, an authentic masterpiece. Luca Giordano's The Liberation of St. Peter is a veritable cracker of a painting, as Brian likes to refer to it. <laughs> Methinks the Toledo Museum of Art's visionary founder, Edward Drummond Libby, would be utterly proud of our new addition to the collection, a work that doubtless will be appreciated by our Toledo community. My thanks for your attention. Congratulations, Larry. Um, I think you understood from that the pride that we have in the expertise of our great colleagues. And um, Larry's uh, continued work here is bringing great, great art to Toledo and expounding on it beautifully. So um, our deepest gratitude to you, Larry. Um, now it's my great pleasure uh, to introduce the Most Reverend Daniel Thomas, um, Bishop of Toledo. He hails from uh, the city of brotherly love, uh, Philadelphia, and uh, is a graduate of St. Charles Borromeo Seminary, which is in uh, suburban Wynwood in Pennsylvania. He then studied at the Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome, and then served as a priest in the Philadelphia area. And thereafter, he had a 15-year period in Rome, where his primary assignment was as an official of the Congregation for Bishops in the Holy See at the Vatican during which time he also served as adjunct spiritual director at the Pontifical North American College Seminary. He returned to Philadelphia in 2006 as auxiliary bishop, and he joined our Toledo community only late last month. So may I invite you to extend the warmest of Toledo welcomes to Bishop Thomas. What a delight to join you this evening to present this magnificent painting by Luca Giordano, The Liberation of St. Peter. I count it both a privilege and an honor as the new Roman Catholic Bishop of Toledo to be invited to speak this evening to the theological and biblical religious context of the painting. I'm so deeply grateful to Brian for his very gracious invitation and to Larry McNichols, and especially grateful that, to learn that he is also a Philadelphia transplant to Toledo. So I'm glad there's more than one of us now. When I was named Bishop of Toledo, my niece, Emily, took to the internet, as all good young people would, to find out something about Toledo. And then she initially was so excited out of her skin that she came to me to say, Uncle Dan, you have to know that in all the sites, there are two major things you have to see and that should not be missed. I said, Emily, what are they? She said, Uncle Dan, they're your cathedral and the Toledo Museum of Art. <laughs> so now I'm delighted to have been in both. I know I'll be very at home in the one and I'm already feeling at home, thanks to all of you in the other. We'd be remiss if, of course, we didn't use the scriptural text, which is the foundation for this painting. And so I'm happy to share with you the text which comes from the Acts of the Apostles in the New Testament of the Bible. And this is the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 12, verses 5 to 11. 
Peter thus was being kept in prison, but prayer by the church was fervently being made to God on his behalf. On the very night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter, secured by double chains, was sleeping between two soldiers, while outside the door, guards kept watch on the prison. Suddenly, the angel of the Lord stood by him, and a light shone in the cell. He tapped Peter on the side and awakened him, saying, Get up quickly. The chains fell from his wrists. The angel said to him, Put on your belt and your sandals. He did so. Then he said to him, Put on your cloak and follow me. So he followed him out, not realizing what was happening, though the angel was real. He thought he was seeing a vision. They passed the first guard, then the second, and came to the iron gate leading out to the city, which opened for them by itself. They emerged and made their way down an alley, and suddenly the angel left him. When most people consider the life of the apostle Peter, they think of those passages found in the four Gospels, a familiar rugged fisherman, a challenged believer, a fearful follower, the first to enter the tomb of Jesus and be amazed at the reality of the resurrection. But what happened next, and when did Peter land in jail? For this, we move from the Gospels and enter into the Acts of the Apostles, the sequel volume, if you will, to St. Luke's Gospel, and inspirational source for this Giordano painting. Our painting's namesake, the center with the angel, Peter, dominates the whole first half of the Acts of the Apostles, which give us the background. The Acts of the Apostles opens with the Pentecost event, the apostles empowered by the Holy Spirit, the promised gift of the Lord after his ascension. They were now ignited with zeal to witness publicly and urge others to believe, repent, and be baptized. This small community of believers was centered at Jerusalem and led by 12 men we know as apostles. Their leader and spokesman according to the appointment of Jesus, was Peter. He preaches the first sermon. He nurtures the communal life. He works the first miracle, and he takes up the missionary work entrusted to them by Jesus. The story of how this tiny community of believers spread to countless cities of the Roman Empire within less than a century is indeed remarkable in itself as a history chapter of humanity. Historically, it's difficult, though, we know, to trace because sources are limited and much that is available is really a faith account, not a record of history as we understand it. Helpful to remember for us tonight is that the first apostles were all good Jews, as were their first converts. For a time, the church remained with every Jewish component, a sect of Israel, of those who believed in the resurrection of Jesus and regarded him as the promised Messiah, who was about to come again and establish the reign of God. Their new faith did not require these apostles so much to break with the ancient law, but in fact, in the early chapters of Acts, we're shown their fidelity to daily prayer in the temple but some of the Jewish leaders, especially the Sadducees, regarded these first Christians as an alien group of nonconformists and wanted to suppress them. Yet because public opinion favored the Christians, and especially due to Peter's miracles, these leaders were unsuccessful in, and were slowed in their progress to rid themselves of these folks. Back to Peter. In the first chapters of Acts, we see a pattern. 
He performs a miracle that attracts attention. He teaches the crowds which gather. Jealous Jewish officials arrest him, and he's put on trial. Then he's imprisoned, and he miraculously escapes. Giordano's painting here before us depicts the third such imprisonment of Peter. But what happened right before this? In his first arrest, Peter and his companion, John, are simply taken into custody by the Sanhedrin. They're released with a warning to end their preaching. But the warning goes unheeded, and soon Peter is imprisoned for a second time. This time, during the night, an angel opens the door and leads them out with the instruction, go and take your place in the temple area and tell the people everything about this life. Now the Sanhedrin had been pushed to their limits and began to speak of death for these irrepressible preachers of Jesus and his resurrection. But the respected Pharisee, Gamaliel, urges that they not be put to death. Instead, he pleads that they be released. If their activity is not of God, it will self-destruct. So the twelve are flogged and once again ordered to cease and desist their preaching of Jesus. Ironically, they rejoiced in being found worthy to suffer for the sake of the name of Jesus. They returned to their homes and to the temple only to increase their fervor to carry out their preaching mission. This fervor picked them beyond Jerusalem. The apostles carried their message to the ends of the Mediterranean coast. At first, they confined their evangelizing efforts to their fellow Jews, but in time, they broke that custom and spoke to all, including the Greeks. Their leader, Stephen, the deacon, was arrested and sent to the Sanhedrin, speaking against the temple. When questioned by the high priest, he becomes polemic about the temple. Stoned to death, his martyrdom triggered a general persecution of Christians. The Christians scattered from Jerusalem to the countryside and surrounding regions, but never ceased preaching the gospel. Rather than curtail the apostles, the persecution fuels them. Acts 12 opens with a famine and a new political twist. A new king, Herod, is ruling Palestine. This Herod is Herod Agrippa I, the grandson of the hated Herod the Great and brother to Herodias, you can see a nearby painting, and brother-in-law and nephew to Herod Antipas, also in a nearby painting, who ruled at the time of Jesus. He was a child when his father was executed, so his mother sent him to Rome, both for the sake of safety and to procure a Roman education. There he grew up with various members of the imperial family, such as Caligula and Claudius. When these came to power, he enjoys privilege and becomes ruler over Palestine. But having been disfavored by the Jewish people, he's always eager to gain the favor of their leaders. Belonging to an unoccupied people, the Jewish leaders had only as much power and authority as was granted them by their occupiers. But since Herod Agrippa was always trying to please them, they exercised a considerable amount of influence. Indeed, it was that influence that led to the execution of the first of the 12 apostles, James, and then the third imprisonment of Peter. The two became the victims of antagonism between the Jewish leaders and their king. Peter's intended execution is only delayed because of the Jewish feast of unleavened bread. Most likely, Herod locked up Peter in the Tower of Antonia, the headquarters of the Roman army in Jerusalem, which was northwest of the temple area. Roman night guard was divided into four three-hour watches with a squadron of four soldiers assigned to each watch. Peter was chained on each side to a soldier. 
while the other two would keep watch outside the cell. Although the Christians prayed fervently for his release, so many believed outside of those prayers that there was little chance it could occur. No doubt the author provides all these details so that the miraculous character of Peter's release would stand out boldly. Peter himself seems passive in the scripture passage. Even as the events unfold, he's not fully conscious, we're told by Luke, of just what is transpiring. His deliverance is all God's doing, enacted by an angel of the Lord. It's clear that the future of the church is being directed by the hand of God and not by any maneuver of human power. Chapter 12 ends on a triumphal note. The famine and the persecution at Jerusalem are now ended. God's word continues to grow. With the exception of Peter's presence at the so-called Council of Jerusalem, we've no other scriptural references to what happened. Trace details, for example, in 1 Peter, a letter attributed to him, indicate his presence in Babylon, but we learn nothing of his mission. Early Christian writers, such as Clement of Rome and Ignatius of Antioch and Irenaeus, the historian, and Eusebius, agree that Peter's final years were spent in Rome. Eusebius reports his death under Nero's reign, probably in the persecution that followed the fire of 64. In a sense, Peter's liberation, so lavishly depicted in this painting, can be seen as a birthing moment, if you will, for the church. Indeed, the Lucan imagery, resplendent with the angel of the Lord and the light shining and emanating from the angel, takes us back to that nocturnal and darkened cave at Bethlehem. It conjures up the prayer of praise and thanksgiving found at the start of 1 Peter, which speaks of an imperishable inheritance made possible by our new birth to a living hope. Some scripture commentators see Peter's release as a resurrection. Undeniable are the many details of Christ's passion, death, and resurrection, which parallel the arrest, imprisonment, and liberation of Peter found in Acts. Indeed, Peter's experience of a birth unto resurrection could bring both images together and seemingly fulfill the test of God's intervention proposed by Gamaliel at the moment of Peter's first deliverance by an angel of the Lord from prison. But it's Luke's apologetic manner of describing Peter's deliverance from the persecuting hands of Herod that argues for the church's unfailing eternal foothold. Could this be Giordano's reason for painting Peter's foot as grounded but moving and carried forward by the upward thrust of the transcendence of the angel's foot? In Peter's speech, following the Pentecost moment, Luke says that those who heard him were cut to the heart. They asked Peter what their next steps might be. Repent, be baptized, and receive the Holy Spirit. Where Peter's steps go next remain unknown, but perhaps also universal to the ends of the earth, even to the heart of the Roman Empire, where he himself would be martyred. While our interpretation of Acts must account for the evangelists' theological aims and interests and refrain from a purely literal reading of the historical data, we have proof that the church did indeed survive the persecution leveled against its earlier adherents, albeit not without the great price of countless martyrs. Scholars assert that Acts was written sometime after the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, with agreement on the years between 80 and 90. The next widespread Roman persecution of Christians 
would begin again in 91 under Domitian. But there's another work of art in this museum, in a gallery rather far away from here, and in a book of the Bible, Revelation, whose image of the church is quite different than this moment, which is perhaps for another invitation to this museum. <laughs> I can't help having lived and worked in Rome for so many years to deeply appreciate the richness of this painting, but also to draw your attention to one thing which I found rather unique, and that is the finger of the angel. Larry already pointed us to the hands being so significant. Now, if any of you have any Italian background, and having lived 15 years in Italy, I can tell you, though I am German-Irish by descent, part of my heart and part of my stomach are now Italian. <laughs> if anybody has an Italian grandmother, they may have heard her at some point in their life go, it's a classic Italian gesture. On the one hand, I wonder if the angel is tisking Peter and reprimanding him. But on the other hand, the angel's finger is pointing forward and upward. And notice Peter's face. He seems caught not at the angel, but on something quite beyond the painting and quite beyond us. For this moment in time, our meditation on Giordano's depiction of Peter's miraculous release from prison with the assistance of the angel of the Lord reveals to us what it offered to those who were first called Christians, the promise and power of the Holy Spirit to carry them into every time and place. And perhaps for each of us individually, it carries a freedom, a releasing, a freedom from sin, a freedom from addiction, a freedom from anguish, a freedom from persecution, a freedom which is not arranged by the power that we have, but a freedom arranged only by God and accomplished only by Him. The finger points us to the divine, and so does Giordano. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Bishop Thomas, for a wonderfully eloquent and erudite and splendidly delivered commentary on the theological and biblical significance of this painting and so much else. And one thought that struck me looking at the painting and knowing that it was painted in the early 1660s, that meant that Giordano was in his early 30s when he painted it. He was a very, very prolific artist, so he had a big studio. And of course, that's also true of Rubens, that why this is so important is that we know it was fully painted by Rubens. And uh, this um, young man then became this older man, um, which is St. Peter here, because Giordano died in his, in his 70s. We have wonderful works of art in this museum, and uh, we have two wonderful people whom I'm going to invite you to ask perhaps a question.